start this off by talking about William Stafford a little bit. He, he, um, he was born in Kansas. When the, he grew up and the United States went into World War II, he had always been a conscientious objector. And so he worked in a, uh, he was a pacifist, so he worked in camps and projects for conscientious objectors in Arkansas, California, and Illinois. And you can imagine that that was not easy at that time because if there was any war that people judged as the war that had to be fought, it was World War II. And he, has, he wrote a book called Down in My Heart, if you're interested more in the, that experience, that's a prose book about his experience in the uh, camps for conscientious objectors. And so we associate William Stafford, who later came to Oregon, taught at Lewis and Clark for 30 years or so, um, was a poet laureate, a job he re of Oregon. He was also, I'm sorry, I forget the name of the post for the United States. It was called the consultant to the Library of Congress, I guess. And later they changed that to the United States Poet Laureate, but it was basically the same position. So he has been recognized very much outside of Oregon, and, uh, but is often identified with Oregon. And the Friends of William Stafford right now is, has submitted an application for a stamp with him on it in 2014, since that would have been his 100th birthday. So if anybody wants to write a letter to them, I think there's information in the newsletter that's over there, the Friends of William Stafford newsletter, because it would be very nice to have someone from Oregon on a postage stamp, right? <laughs> William Stafford, and to get people to think about peace and poetry. I have an old newspaper article that uh, I saved from back when, it says 1977, when I was teaching at Michigan State University, and he came back there to visit. And uh, the school paper, the Michigan State newspaper, did an interview. And uh, I just looked at these things that he said. I thought they were interesting. Start your poems with nothing, which is a nice way to say it. If you have a good idea, that's bad, because the way you recognize a good idea in a hurry is it's already recognized. It's probably someone else's idea. <laughs> I've got to start with my own, no matter how trivial or shabby, starting with nothing and being willing to say welcome to anything. He also said he never knows what a poem will be before he writes it. It mentions also the part, if you know anything about Stafford, you know that he wrote every day. Can you imagine? I mean, I think it's great. I've resolved that many times in my life. I've done it for maybe 30 days. And something interrupts you, but um, the Stafford archive up at Lewis and Clark has copies of all his drafts and everything. So if you doubt it, you can go up and look and they're dated and they, there are many, many of them up there in the uh, archive. What you are saying today as a writer has to be based on who you are today and what kind of situation you are in. To those who would help others write poetry, Stafford recommended they not anticipate or teach lessons, but that they recognize, confirm, and reinforce impulses already present in their students. It's the initiation from within that we're trying to induce, he said. I won't read the whole thing, but that gives you a little idea of his character, his personality. I will just read a poem by Stafford and then see how I'll read something of my own later. I love the poems where he refers to Kansas. I left there when I was two and I was always happy my parents moved to the West Coast, but I still had a feeling of connection and Kansas seems to be the center of the country. The Peters family. At the end of their ragged field, a new field began Miles told the sunset that Kansas would, ne would hardly ever end, and that beyond the Cimarron crossing and after the row crop land, a lake would surprise the country and sag with a million birds. You couldn't analyze those people. A no pattern had happened to them. Their field opened and opened, level and more than forever, never crossed. Their world went everywhere. As I said, I came from Kansas. My parents were born in Kansas. My father was born in 1913, and three weeks later, in 1914, William Stafford was born. So I just wanted to read a poem about my father, uh, another man, good, good man from Kansas. Kansas, 1913-1992. 
My father smelled of metal, of solder and wire, of stop bath, cigarettes, whiskey, leather, airplanes, and coffee. My father was tall like a telephone pole and could walk into the sky on climbing hooks. His hair was curly as a lamb's wool and his smile was crooked like a farm boy's hat. When he was hungry, he was hungry, and after he ate, he would smile and say, funny, I'm not hungry anymore. After he ate, he'd take a nap. People said of him, that man, Kansas, can nap just about anywhere. It didn't matter where, a couch or the hood of a car. He'd lie on his back, hands folded, snore lightly for five minutes, and then he was wide awake, ready for the next thing. Now, I can't resist telling you a story that somebody else's anecdote. I was at Dorothy Stafford's 96th birthday party on Sunday, and she and there was a picture there of Dorothy as a young woman with a very large dog. I think it was an Airedale or something like that, you know, big. And she said that when they got that dog, she wanted a dog, and she wanted a small dog, and Bill wanted a big dog. And you know what an Airedale is like. They're really big. So she said he brought the dog home and he said, you know, marriage about compromise, so I got you a small dog and it's going to grow up to be a big dog. 